I'm Professor Ian Hickey. I'm the co-director of Health and Policy for the Brain and Mind Centre. I'm glad to be accompanied this evening by my co-director, Professor Catherine Revshorgi, here also at the Brain and Mind Centre of the University of Sydney. It's a great pleasure for us to convene these meetings, particularly on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of these lands which were never ceded, and really important in a lot of our work here with the university, not only to pay respect to their leaders past and present, but to recognise the contribution that they have made to learning on these lands probably for over 60,000 years, which is kind of funny because we revisited our colonial history this week of 250 years of colonial history, with the visits of the colonial uh, founders of what's called the modern nation to recognise, in fact, the 60,000 years of what has actually happened here. And as pointed out by Professor Jacqueline Troy on many occasions, our Director of Indigenous Research and someone we work with very closely in our mental wealth initiatives and more broadly in our international things. For those of us who washed up in boats in the recent times, including my relatives from the west coast of Ireland, we've been here for a short period of time, but the values of the traditional people of these lands, particularly around collective action, particularly around social cohesion, particularly about the mental health of all, not just of me, but the mental health of us as a collective concept has been here for a very long time. And that's really important because that's basically what we're going to revisit tonight. We're going to talk about the multidisciplinary initiatives of the universities and one of the partnerships that we have, the Mental Wealth Initiative, which is led by two of our professors, Joe Ocapinti from the Brain and Mind Centre and John Buchanan from the Business School. We had the pleasure earlier this year of convening a forum at the World Economic Forum in Davos, you know, where that Masters of the Universe get together in January in sort of a French ski place and discuss what's going to happen to the rest of us. We did have the pleasure of running a forum on mental wealth in that area, particularly because the issue of how do you measure wealth, what really is wealth, and what is the collective wealth of all of us is a central topic for developed nations and for developing nations. And importantly, it was associated, from my point of view, with a great deal of anxiety. What is the future of all of us as people have developed economically? Have we developed socially? Have we developed collectively? What is the situation now? What is happening in a year be fair to say, of considerable geopolitical disruption on obviously the threats to security, the Ukraine war on other issues and what has happened since in the Middle East, but also on big issues, particularly the development of AI and of new technologies and what will be the ramifications of that for societies, particularly if we leave it up to a bunch of very unusual people in Silicon Valley in California to determine what is the collective future of all of us. Good to see a collective anxiety and a need to think about what really is the mental wealth of nations, how is it measured, what determines it, what is the implications for social policy for all of us collectively as a global community, but in each of the communities in which we live. So it's great to have the discussion tonight led by Joe and by John who've been working on these technical issues and the social policy implications. Important to have our other guests, particularly Richard Dennis as the Executive Director of the Australia Institute, a group that kind of cares. <laughs> about what is the relationship between economic development, social policy choices, economic choices, as to comment on that. And we're going to have me get off shortly and be replaced by Elfie Scott, who's an award-winning journalist and presenter, to convene that conversation. But I do want to take the opportunity to thank Sydney Ideas for taking this forward. These are really important issues to us at the University of Sydney. Uh, Mark Scott, our Vice-Chancellor, and David Thody, our new Chancellor, have made it clear that being significantly engaged the social licence to operate, what is it that universities actually contribute, to what extent are they genuinely involved in providing technical and academic expertise into the major social issues, is the basis on which our lives, our public funding and our contribution needs to be measured on an ongoing basis. So we're really glad to actually talk about what we do academically, have people like Richard comment on its utility or not in the wider world, and then happily have discussion with you as a wider audience as from a societal point of view, what do you value? What is that mental wealth? Not just mental health, but how do we measure that in the wealth of the nations in which we now reside? So I'm gonna hand over at this point to Elfie. Take over, please. Hello everybody, I will just do a quick introduction and let you know that Joanne Ocapinti will be presenting now, followed by John Buchanan.
Thank you, and uh, good evening, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for this pivotal discussion. Um, I think most of us would agree that since the pandemic, um, uh, mental health is has really there's really been a growing understanding um, of the the potential impact of, of mental health on us all, silently impacting our families, uh, our communities, our workplaces, our productivity, and our future. Despite decades of research, statutory inquiry, system reforms, and action plans. Um, and significant investments by government, business and philanthropy, rates of psychological distress and mental disorder are not decreasing. In fact, for young people, rates are increasing. At the Brain and Mind Centre, we've been working over many years to understand how we, how we can really turn these trends around. Um, one of the most important insights from our systems modelling and simulation work has been while that um, has been that while strengthening mental health systems is crucial for providing quality and timely care, it simply isn't enough. Because, and to use a bathtub for a simple an, uh, analogy, the inflow of people with mental health issues is far exceeding the outflow or the mental health system's capacity to help people achieve recovery. So the level of distress and disorder across the population remains elevated. The way forward seems straightforward. We simply need to turn down the tap. The problem is that research has pointed to a complex array of social factors contributing to that inflow. Things like domestic violence and social media and housing insecurity and adverse early life exposures and an erosion of our social cohesion and many, many more that overwhelm policymakers. But we at the Mental Wealth Initiative have been asking what if these social determinants are merely symptoms that are distracting us from addressing a key root cause? What if the key to better social and psychological health actually lies in fundamentally transforming the very foundation of our economy? Let's take this lens to the issue of youth mental health. Economic policies can have unintended consequences that directly and indirectly affect youth mental health. For example, while industrial relations reforms implemented since the 1980s and 90s in advanced economies have improved business flexibility, they've also increased job insecurity, intensified work pressures and reduced the financial security of households. While deregulation of the financial sector has created a more competitive financial system, Along with, economic along with other economic policies, it has also seen household debt soar. These can have knock-on effects of increasing parental stress, family conflict, disengagement, can increase the risk of drug and alcohol misuse and domestic violence, all of which significantly affect youth mental health. Also, research has shown us that unemployment and underemployment are direct contributors to suicide rates. Yet labour underutilisation amongst young people has reached 20, nearly 25%. Last year, 9 in 10 young Australians reported experiencing financial difficulties. 70% were struggling to find affordable housing and 20% were experiencing food insecurity. It is clear that young people today are fa facing vastly different structural pre pressures than previous generations, eroding their well-being and resilience. So how did we get here? What the last 60 years has shown us is just how powerful the rhetoric around a single, uh, around a single metric can be in shaping our world. Since the founding meeting of the OECD in December 1960, which firmly established economic growth as the foremost global objective, GDP has become entrenched as a top line indicator of a government's good management of their economies and welfare of their nations. Since then, GDP has been used to justify economic um, policy focused on the pursuit of greater and greater consumption, economic efficiency and worker productivity to the, to the point that our health, social, uh, political and environmental systems are now showing significant signs of deterioration and fragility. Economic policies has shaped a world where insecurity and anxiety about the future is taking hold where scarcity, uh, inequality, high competition and a focus on individualism is breeding self-interest, 
distrust, fear, and eroding our sense of community, leaving us feeling isolated and disconnected. Coupled with the existential threats or existential uncertainties of generative AI driven job displacement and climate change, there is a growing sense of hopelessness amongst young people that their ambitions for the future will not be fulfilled, creating fertile ground for youth mental health issues to continue, which is outpacing the capacity of our treatment systems to respond. We will not be able to effectively and sustainably address the youth mental health crisis until we understand that economic policy is unequivocally mental health policy. There is no instrument more powerful in changing the course of our nation's mental health trajectory. And the international community agrees. In May this year, I had the privilege of being invited to attend the 77th World Health Assembly where member states overwhelmingly endorsed a special resolution to recognise the inextricable link between economic policy and health, including mental health, and work to realign economic health with the well-being of uh, ecosystems, communities and individuals. I've also recently returned from New York, where the UN General Assembly adopted the Pact for the Future. Among its action items, the pact formally recognises the inadequacies of GDP and calls for urgent development of measures of progress that better support sustainable development. These events mark a significant uh, milestone in the global wellbeing economy movement. Countries including Scotland, Wales, Iceland, New Zealand, Finland, Australia and others are leading efforts to measure prosperity beyond GDP. Specifically, they are incorporating a broad range of indicators including educational attainment, health, income inequality and environmental sustainability into their national frameworks. And in Australia, we have the Measuring What Matters framework. While these wellbeing indicator dashboards importantly provide rich information on the various dimensions of population wellbeing, with upwards of 50 different indicators, they fall short in offering a clear picture of overall progress in the way that GDP does. As a result, GDP remains a privileged indicator used to justify policies that are eroding our mental, uh, our well-being and resilience, with investments to foster social and environmental well-being secondary objectives if nations can afford it and if, um, if it's politically convenient. This is a major barrier to achieving well-being economies. So how do we begin to overcome this barrier? Well, firstly, we propose integrating social production into our system of national accounts. Now, social production is the glue that holds society together. It includes activities such as volunteering, caregiving, uh, ecological restoration, informal mentoring, civic participation and uh, unpaid contributions to the, to the arts. Activities that contribute to strengthening the social fabric of communities. Social production can give uh, people a sense of belonging and purpose and connectedness that fosters their mental health. It supports our ability to be productive in the formal economy. It improves environmental well-being. And it gives us surge capacity to respond effectively in times of crisis. In essence, social production makes nations more prosperous, more cohesive, and more resilient. For young people, supported engagement in socially productive activities can offer meaningful social roles and an opportunity to, de to develop a positive self-concept, empathy, an outward-looking sense of purpose, and the opportunity, uh, sorry, and uh, community connectedness, which can improve their mental health and well-being, their pro-social pro behaviours, and their life satisfaction. Social production is the missing part of the production equation, the fruit of human productivity that we currently do not uh, do not measure. Sorry, that we currently do not value and insufficiently invest in. Combined with economic production, we call this the mental wealth of the nation. Because when we have environments that foster brain health, mental health, cognitive skills, and collective social and emotional well-being, we contribute in positive ways to the economy and to society. So measuring, monitoring, and re regularly reporting on the value of social production 
and having it integrated into the national accounts rather than an aside, we hope will help catalyse cult a cultural and political shift towards a more balanced view of national prosperity. This shift can foster a new narrative and open uh, new doors to innovative solutions for rebuilding our social fabric. Two ideas um, in particular that we think offer promise um, are firstly the social production wage, which offers a living wage in exchange for engagement in socially productive activities, and national time banks, which allow individuals to earn time credits by providing social production related activities um, to others, and then they can use the deposited time credits to access services they might need in the future. And you can read more about time banks in the QR code on your screen. Both policy innovations offer promise in strengthening community cohesion, promoting inclusivity, contributing to tackling the loneliness epidemic, and enhancing social and economic prosperity, thereby creating positive environments for mental well-being. But these are just two ideas. There may be many, many more um, that we can propose as we start to engage with the idea of policies that foster the mental wealth of a nation. So in conclusion, we, in conclusion, we are where they were, at a pivotal moment in history that demands a new approach. The thinking and tools that guided us through the 20th century are simply not suited to the challenges and threats of the 21st century. But shifting the entrenched economic narrative and frameworks won't be easy, and it won't be achieved by progressive economists alone. We all have a critical role to play alongside economists in advocating for well-being promoting policy and legislation, in taking up new metrics and in mobilising communities for change. We must push ourselves beyond our traditional boundaries to reshape economies that will foster health and well-being for all. Thank you. Thanks for that great introduction, Joe. Um, I'm going to follow on from Joe's presentation to talk about the topic of mental well-being and uh, social connection at work. Joe gave you a very good outline about what the mental wealth uh, idea is about. I'm going to tunnel down um, and give you some details on what it means for issues at work and in the labour market. Um, can I give a little apology up front? Um, I've only got 10 minutes and I prepared a presentation that's going to take about 40. <laughs> so I'm going to cut it down to 10 minutes. So I'm going to skip through a lot of slides. We can come back to them later. So what I want to quickly cover is where am I coming from? What are we finding? And how can we help improve things? So just quickly, where am I coming from? I'm the labour market guy, right? Joe's from the Brain and Mind Centre. Joe and Ian came over and saw me um, a couple of years ago and they said, we've got this really um, interesting idea. Mental health is a really important issue, but we're not giving enough attention to building psychological strength on a collective basis. And I thought, that's a really nice, simple idea. And they came to me as the labour market guy because workplaces are an important site where things um, are either strengthened or undermined. And what I want to share with you tonight are some of the really big facts that I think are worth reflecting on. Joe's um, talked to you about uh, the rising mental disorders for the young, but I want to draw to your attention some of the really killer facts that are coming out of the labour market at the moment. Joe talked about insecurity, she talked about young people. But if you look at the workers' compensation systems, you've got to remember, Australia's done a fantastic job on work health and safety, right? More per capita, fewer people are being killed and injured at work today than ever. We, it's a huge success story, success story that we don't talk about. 
except for mental disorders. And this is data from the New South Wales Treasury Managed Funds. And just look at the scale of that growth. That's total days off work from 2010 to 2021, basically coming virtually from nowhere to up to now uh, 300,000 days a year. That's teachers and nurses. And remember, this is um, not just... These aren't insecure people in insecure jobs, right? It's turning it around. It's not just the, the problems of people on the periphery of society. These are people who are actually in jobs where there's a, a labour shortage. And this was confirmed also in the recent Royal Commission um, released on suicides in the armed forces and in DV8. Armed forces, except for the natural hazard of the job, they're one of the most secure jobs you could have. Look at um, medical separations. Very similar period of time, right? 20, from you know, 2003 to 2010, around 600 a year. That's now up to 1,800 a year. Astronomical growth. And most of that growth is in mental health. The, the, uh, th the bottom three colours are mental health related. So in 2017, mental health related departures were 55% of the armed forces. They're now 75%. So I'm showing these as paradoxical facts. Joe's talked about the underlying insecurities that are part of the problem. When you get to the labour market, it's those even insecure jobs that are having problems. So what's driving that? We think, and these are important data to reflect on, there has been a decline in social support at work. It's very hard to get data on social support at work, but the Bureau of Statistics collects really interesting information. I'll just see, is there a little point? Oh, good. Can you see that? This is data on how much work, how, how many workers in Australia get any kind of training, right? And you'll see that the, the statistic you should really look at is this one here. In 2005, in any one year, 35.9% of workers reported that they got work-related training on the job. That's now down to 23%. Right, so what we've seen is on-the-job training is a good proxy the kind of support you get at the workplace. But wait, there's more. If you go to the um, uh, Household Income Labor Dynamics of Australia, it's um, been tracking 15,000 um, families and uh, workers for uh, over 21 years now. And this is just some basic data that was pulled out by the Black Dog Institute that's highly relevant. And you'll see that there's a decline in control, people feeling in control of their working lives. So that's a sense of how much freedom do you have at work. That's in decline over two decades. And what about complexity on the job? That's been going up. So social support's been going down. Complexity's been going up and control uh, has been increasing. But then the final one is work intensification. This is actually strain on the job. And this is data that was pulled out by people at NatSim at uh, the University of Canberra and there's a direct correlation between work intensification, where work intensification is high, your mental health is comparatively lower, significantly lower if you're a male. So the really interesting question is, what do you do about it? And Joe gave you some insights into this. And um, we've got an agenda which says you've got to look at this at three, at three levels. At the national level, you've got to think about what's the metric for success. Uh, and that's a, that's, a big, that's a big game, right? And we recognise that trying to change GDP is something that you should certainly go for, but you don't put all your eggs in that basket. We also think that you've got to think about um, getting practical tools that people can use day in, day out to track the kind of problems that I've identified in those earlier slides. And um, I'll go into that in a minute. And then the third part of our research program is working with people at pivotal points in the labour market who can, by changing their practice, have knock-on effects for changing other people's practice. And one of the groups who are working with there is the workers' compensation systems, particularly I care in New South Wales. They are at the intersection of the labour market, the health system and insurance. And if you can get a change there, that can have knock-on effects into other parts of the economy. So let me just give you, I can elaborate on all of these. Remember, I've only got 10 minutes. So I'm just going to give you one worked example of what we've been doing 
with industry funds management. That's the peak organisation for uh, industry super schemes in this country. And uh, you may or may not know, but Australia's superannuation system is one of the biggest sources of savings in the world. And because of this, uh, they have huge amounts of money to invest and uh, they are no longer just little minority shareholders. They are often owning assets in their own right. And they're not speculative investors. When they invest, they invest for 20 to 30 years. So they've got a problem. They recognise these are issues. How do you maintain it, what they're calling a socially sustainable workplace? And they've approached us and we're working with them to try and clarify how do you generate a socially sustainable workplace. And they said they wanted metrics. And we said, well, hold on a minute. As typical academics, we said, maybe it's not that straightforward. You just don't dive straight into metrics. And they've been a delight to work with. They're, they're perfect partners. And we said, if you want to um, really get clarity uh, uh, about getting a sustainable workplace, you've got to have an understanding of who's responsible for managing it. And that's actually quite difficult because when you look at the assets that the super runs funds own, there are six different levels of management. And the way in which our accountability systems are structured, it's often hard to identify who within it is responsible for what. So the first thing you've got to do is clarify who's got to be accountable. You've then got to be asked, what are they accountable for? And this is where uh, they own some, some ports, for example. But if you want to understand what's going on in a port, so they will own that part of the overall value chain ecosystem. But what goes on in a port is shaped by the shipping lines, um, the exporters and uh, importers owning the cargo, those who own the, uh, the container parks, transport operators and stevedores. So that's the second thing. You don't just have to know who and how, you don't have to get better coordination with management. You've got to have clarity about what it is you're tracking. And then, then you can elaborate on the data items. Now, I do apologise. I do realise that's a user-hostile PowerPoint. But it's just letting you know that this is the level of detail we're getting down to. So if you want to have a sustainable workplace, we've started to identify the data items that you need to track. And this isn't just relevant to um, the industry super funds. We're also working with the Queensland Nurses Union they also have a very uh, difficult issue in, in socially sustainable workplaces and this is where the projects are helping each other and clarifying the data items that you could go through. So how are we to conclude? Um, basically, as a, as a research program, we are, as um, academics, not your typical academ academics. Joe and I have both worked outside the normal mainstream. For us, policy is a domain that needs its own research. You just don't go away and figure out what the problem is. Academics are really good at figuring out what the problem is. It's figuring out what to do about it is another um, example of another problem in itself. And we spend a lot of our time researching the options. And so I've given you a little case study of what we're doing with the super funds and the Queensland Nurses Union. That's part of this research program. Understanding the problem, but also identifying ways forward. But I did want to finish with a note that we are also realistic. You can research a really good solution, but often people don't want to follow it. So as academics, we unpack critical paradoxes, which is what academics do, and we get quite excited by that. So even if no one impl implements any of our ideas, we've introduced some interesting ideas along the way. So <laughs> thanks for giving me the time, and I can elaborate on any of this in, in your questions. Thank you so much for that, John. That was brilliant. I would love to welcome to the panel now Joe as well as Richard. Okay, so just before we jump into this part of the session, uh, I will tell you that we will have a Q&A segment at the end. So you can submit questions via Slido if you would like throughout this section. Uh, just head to slido.com and tap in mental wealth as your uh, little key code there. And you could submit online or you can just pop your hand up if you're in the audience with us tonight. 
So, we do have a ridiculously impressive panel with us here. So, John as a labour market expert, Joe as an epidemiologist, and Richard as an economist. So, we're going to have a very interesting session. And John, I would love to start off by asking you probably a very simple question mm. here, but what is the difference between mental health and mental wealth? Are you simply suggesting that we need to bolster our mental health resources? Mm. No, that, that's a really good question. And look, um, Ian and I went to Davos um, earlier this year and we, had, we invited a panel of very eminent people from all over the world to participate. And I'm somebody who's had a lot of experience in organising these panels. I spent two days before the workshop having to explain that concept to <laughs> Sorry the Sorry to make you do it again. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, because... Often people think what we're talking about is mental health services at scale, right? We, we showed you that data that um, the mental disorders are going up. Joe showed it for you for young people. I showed it for you for people even in secure jobs. Um, but it's, the, the solution to that isn't to, create, well, to have more psychologists and more socio uh, um, psychologists and psychiatrists. That's, you saw the scale of the increases. I mean, they were, I don't know if you look at Joe's numbers, they are astronomical. There's something going on with young people. There's something really very sad going on with young people in terms of the mental distress they're going through. But if we simply train more psychologists and more psychiatrists, we are letting the generative mechanisms that are creating the problem just simply get off the hook. And the driving force for us is how do you stop the problem at source? And so... Uh, the, the key ideas we picked up from, from British, some British researchers, they basically said, as we look out to the future, in the past, um, success of a society has been determined by uh, producing monetized material wealth. That's what GDP is. But they said, as we look out over the next 50 or 100 years, we're going to have to look at the mental dimension of life. And that's where we get that notion of mental wealth. There's monetized material wealth, but the mental dimension is, as a society becomes more mature, is the d domain through which we can flourish. Thank you for that. Richard, as an economist, do you acknowledge the shortfalls of GDP? Oh, yeah, of course, and, and everyone does. Um, look, GDP is just a number. You know, and John and I and Joe were talking earlier that, you know, I think non-economists take GDP a lot more seriously than most economists. No, it's just a number. And, and, and if you turn a number into your goal in life, whether that's your superannuation balance or the number of Facebook friends you have or GDP, you will stuff it up. It doesn't mean that the number can't tell you something interesting, but you can't ever turn you know, a simple number in, into a life goal for an individual or for a country. So, I mean, I think what these guys are talking about is fascinating. And... I think we need to understand that you know, GDP has always been flawed, and if you Google flaws with GDP, you'll find fantastic quotes uh, from since its inception. To, to paraphrase the guys, and they were all guys who invented it, they said, please, please, please don't ever use this as an indicator of national progress. Please, please don't do that. <laughs> right. Is that the quote? No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a paraphrase. But I'm just saying the people who invented it weren't stupid. The people who invented it were trying to figure out how to rebuild Europe post-World War II, where literally all the infrastructure had been bombed to oblivion. And you know what? Maximising the rate at which you could build bricks and lay them was really important data to have in 1950 in Germany. All right? So for us to sort of sit back in 2024 and go, oh, it's a pretty silly indicator, it leaves a few things out, we know. All right, but our elected representatives and a whole bunch of people in my profession working on their behalf are very quick to say it's kind of the be-all and end-all. So, so just quickly, I mean, keep this in mind, that in economics, when we've got something dumb to say, we usually say it in Latin, okay? Because that means we can tell you how limited our analysis is, but you don't really understand it. I'm seeing some medical professionals. <laughs> yeah, exactly, all right? But we do it to a larger audience. So in economics, we make a lot of claims, all other things being equal. Ceteris paribus, we say. Ceteris paribus. All other things being equal. 
So to be clear, if I said, John, all other things equal, would you like 10,000 bucks? Yes. Right. Good answer. No, most people, why wouldn't you? But if I said, John, would you like 10,000 bucks, but along with the 10,000 bucks, you don't get to spend any time with the people you love most for the next 10 years, would you take the 10,000 bucks? Right. He wasn't wrong the first time he said it. But if we say, look, all other things being equal, wouldn't you rather live in a society with a bigger GDP than a smaller one? Yeah, you should. You really should. But if the way we're growing GDP is ruining our lives, ceteris isn't paribus anymore. <laughs> That's not Latin, by the way. <laughs> right? All other things aren't equal. So it's, a, it's just a simple trick. Right? We're focusing on the bit we can measure, personal income or national income. We're focusing on that with laser-like focus. And we're ignoring all this other stuff. And economists never said, ignore all that other stuff. We never, ever did. And you really, really shouldn't. But now we've kind of got this bizarre situation that we believe we have to maximise GDP and we're struggling with the irony that it's making us sad. Well, we shouldn't... No, but we shouldn't do the things. Like, don't take the 10,000 bucks. Don't take that extra 0.1% economic growth if it's ruining the lives of your kids. But these are subjective decisions that, that we have to make. And more information will help us make it. But those trade-offs have always been there. But we've been trained to just look at the, the simple to measure stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Joe, you mentioned young people uh, in your presentation, and you're focusing in on the mental health of young people. But I wonder what groups would be captured by a mental wealth economy that aren't currently captured by that GDP metric? Um, sorry, Could you just repeat the question. Oh, yes, sorry. of course, sorry. So, I mean, when we're talking about the contributions that certain groups make, right. uh, what sort of yeah. contributions are being missed by GDP? Yeah, so when we were, um, we have been um, making efforts at measuring social production to really understand, you know, who's doing what in terms of what we're not seeing in our, in our um, macro um, measures. And we, um, uh, we measured Australia's uh, social production based on the time use survey. Um, and uh, what we found was that I think um, Australians were contributing $288 billion per year um, in terms of social production. I think that's about 14% of GDP. Um, we did the same in the, uh, in the US. We worked with Harvard um, and the Reform for Resilience Commission and Rice University's um, Baker Institute for Public Policy to develop uh, or to estimate the US social production. And it was around $2.3 trillion, which is about 9.8% um, of their GDP. And what was interesting um, about uh, th those estimates is looking at the breakdown, as you were, were saying. Um, and it's, it's um, those people that are traditionally undervalued in the formal economy that are making the greatest contribution. So the over 65s, the unemployed women, um, young people were making a surprisingly large contribution than, than we anticipated. Um, so, uh, but, but what's important is not the absolute number, and these absolute numbers are at the moment flawed because we don't have a good data ecosystem to um, to measure social production, the time use surveys are really only providing us four of the eight categories that we consider to be social production. So we, we do need to strengthen um, uh, the, the data ecosystem so we get a full picture. But the absolute number is less important than the relative change over time. And, and that's why we're working with the OECD, um, who have data um, across 10 countries, across several decades, to try and estimate um, what's happened to social production over time uh, with a view to trying to encourage countries to measure social production moving forward so we can report it on a regular basis, quarterly, at the same time as they're releasing GDP figures, we can release uh, social production figures and really change the, the discourse about um, what, what makes us a prosperous nation. John, why are we talking about mental wealth? now? Why is it more relevant than ever before? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that it's more relevant. I think it's always been relevant. I mean, um, if you look at the kind of philosophical debates about what a meaningful life is, it's, it's, it's been about 
um, companionship and contemplation. You know, they're like the really big ideas if you go back to Aristotle. And that's not monetised material wealth. If you deliver a, a worthwhile life, they're the issues that count. And that, I suppose that's what we're getting back with. Um, we're looking at the, the broader sense of companionship in a, in a very broad sense. So when you're talking about on-the-job training, which is what I was showing you that data on, that is a form of social support and, and companionship. Um, so I, I think what's... The reason... The, 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 the technical answer to your question is the British chief scientist in 2004 said we've got to think about how do we flourish as a society into the, into the, into the coming decades. He, 350 of his closest friends as researchers got together and worked really hard to come up with this idea. Um, they then put it out in the, um, at the beginning of the GFC and the idea got lost. But I think what's happened, in, you know, particularly with the rise of um, mental health challenges, I think more people are asking, we just don't need services at scale. We need to take this issue of prevention more seriously. So I think that's there, there if you like, the social determinants of the, why the issues emerge. But I do think it's always been there. If you look at the debates in philosophy, if you look at um, what policy has been trying to do, there has been a respect for this stuff. It's just been not elevate as much as we're trying to elevate it now. Yeah, right. And Richard, I mean, watching Joe and John's presentations earlier as an economist, how do you look at something like this and, and think about the sort of uh, practical policy frameworks that could implement something like this? Um, yeah, great question. Um, I'll, I'll just take off on what John was saying on my way to answering that. I mean, everyone knows GDP is a bit silly, right? We really, really do. So one thing GDP doesn't capture is, you've heard, household production, you know, or volunteer work. So, so the irony is, if, if I go and pay someone to give me a massage, I don't, I don't know if that was me or not. Um, <laughs> if I go and pay someone 50 bucks to give me a massage, it counts in GDP. But if John and I give each other the massage, it doesn't count. <laughs> Right? I'm but sure everybody wanted that image. <laughs> <laughs> but so if, if we've got kind of healthy relationships where we can help each other out, it literally doesn't count. But economists know this. I can't stress this enough. What GDP captures are, are transactions, not production, transactions. So when there's production for which there's not a transaction, right? when there's a back rub that didn't get cash for it, it's not that we think it didn't happen. It's just literally not included in the thing we call GDP. So a lot of the economic growth that we've measured in the last 30 years is a direct consequence of the fact that, for example, a lot more women work now than used to. So they often, they, their household pays for the production of services that they themselves used to produce. Right? So a woman who used to stay at home and care for kids or husband full time now works full time or part time. All the cooking and cleaning that she, I'm using gender stereotypes, used to do didn't count when they did it at home, but now that they're getting paid to go to work, that counts in GDP, and all the services they buy count in GDP. And we're like, wow, look at all that magic economic growth. But that production was already occurring. It just moved from the unmeasured section into the measured section, because all we're measuring is the transactions. So there's some real challenges when we try to sort of turn this stuff into our national accounts. It's really what we're saying is how will we come up with arbitrary numbers to put on the value of things for which there aren't transactions? Now, I could go to a hairdresser and pay 50 bucks for this haircut. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. I choose not to. <laughs> I'd do it myself, so it doesn't count. Right? But... If, and, and some people here, not you, but the person sitting next to you, might spend 400 bucks on a haircut. I think you're mad. But GDP doesn't think you're mad. GDP doesn't care at all. If you pay 400 bucks, guess what it's worth? 400, 400 bucks. All right, so we're, we kind of, when we're doing our GDP-ness, we're okay with how weird some of your transactions are. We'll settle for any random number you're willing to pay. And no one second guesses it. But the minute these guys come along and say, well, I think we should put a value on volunteer work, you watch the argument about the value of it. 
But we never argue about the value of your haircut. We never argue about the value of anything you do. So the really challenging part of bringing these non-transaction production things into our system of transaction things is coming up with values we can all agree on. And it's really hard, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And you know what? The dumbest number to use for some of this stuff is zero, right? So as long as, and this was Joe's point, as long as we're moving away from zero, that's good. And, and you know, go back to that great photo, here they are sitting around inventing GDP, well, not inventing GDP, but agreeing, let's all obsess with GDP. If that meeting took place today, it wouldn't get anywhere. When GDP was getting invented, when the OECD was agreeing to prioritise it, I promise you there was no consultation. I promise you there was no input from... In no one knew what it was about. They weren't getting consensus on it. Why this is so much harder is having done a pretty dumb thing for a long, long time, people are coming along going, oh, maybe we should tweak it a bit. Hang on, let's get eight billion people's thoughts on this. <laughs> no, no, this is the actual intellectual problem. All right? And they didn't have to go through that when they were cooking this up at the beginning. No one cared. And then it just became a habit. And changing the habit is hard. It doesn't make the habit good. I'm a bit worried, John, because we published that paper in Nature Mental Health mm. on what constitutes social production. Mm. We forgot to add back rubs. <laughs> <laughs> You're just not getting we enough of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and can I just uh, elaborate on um, Richard's point that it's not about um, what's um, valued and we're trying to bring in. We're also trying to note what's been destroyed. So that's why I put up the on-the-job training and I've looked at this over many years, we all heard about labour productivity, the, the miracle of labour productivity boosting in the 80s and 90s. We're still hearing about that, you know, glory years of reform. And then, then people started running around and saying, we've got all these skill shortages. Well, if you strip on the job training out of the system, you run out of experienced people who've been prepared to enter the profession. And so what Joe and I are particularly interested in is making transparent what's going on. So if the reports had been around then, you could have said, Labour productivity has gone up, but you're actually destroying the capacity to move forward by stripping out the capacity to reproduce skill. And so that's, getting that transparency is a, a big motivation. Here. Mm, that's such an important point. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not bored. I'm finding a really good quote. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready with the quote yet? Uh, yeah, if you want. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so Robert Kennedy, 1968, talking about GDP. Famous quote. Some of you might have heard about it. Um, uh, too much and for too long we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product, now over $800 billion a year, but that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special, looks for our, uh, special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder. 1968, in a chaotic sprawl of our cities. It counts napalm, it counts nuclear warheads and armoured cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. 1968. Wow. I'm not having a go at these guys. I'm just saying, like, it's not new that this stuff's crazy. But, and it doesn't mean it's unimportant to try and fix it. It's just hard to fix it. Um, but that's why we need more people to try and fix it. Go read the full speech. It talks about why unis should lead riots. Not kidding. <laughs> that was well worth a Google. <laughs> Joe, uh, we are running out of time, so we will head into the Q&A segment in just a moment. But Joe, I did want to ask you just another sort of practical question. When you speak about uh, the social production wage and national time banks. I think it's such a fascinating idea, but on a very practical level, like what is going to be funding those kind of systems? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think 
there are any number of ideas, but one thing that I, one idea I find quite compelling is Mariana Matsukato in her book, The Entrepreneurial State, talks uh, about governments um, t uh, taking an equity or a share of returns of their investments they make in, in research and innovation rather than just taking the risk while the markets reap the returns. And, and she points to the public sector having contributed to key technologies in the iPhone like GPS, touch screen display, uh, yeah, di display Siri, um, uh, and that sort of thing. Also, um, uh, you know, governments invest in life-saving um, pharmaceuticals and um, green energy technologies and even improvements in baby formula, she speaks about. So if governments took a share of uh, um, the, the profits made from those sorts of innovations, then we would have, um, they w would be able to fund uh, healthcare, um, education, social protection measures to improve financial security for people, um, and, and then have more to invest in research and innovation, creating this very positive feedback loop. So, I mean, that's just one idea, but there are new ways to think about how we design or structure an economy that could look after uh, its people. Can I give one, an example of the time banks too? Like the, the um, German engineering industry has pioneered labour standards for many decades and, and they moved to the shorter work week. Um, this is in the boy late 80s, early 90s and they actually had the idea of a time bank that if an establishment had um, excessive overtime, that was noted, and the workers would bank it up, and then they could take time off. But then what they also did is they would just say that would trigger a recruitment decision. So by tracking time, you then actually um, engaged in labour flows. So instead of then the workplace becoming dependent on a, a small group of people working big hours, they, they would share the hours around. So there's, there's actually quite a bit of experience around in time banks associated with um, industrial relations arrangements and the like. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, we're going to head into the Slido questions now, but I am also going to open up for audience <laughs> questions. If anybody would like to raise their hand, I think that we will have people with roving mics in the audience as well, but I will just, uh, I'll start with this quite spicy question that seems to have gotten a couple of thumbs up, why not? Uh, would attempting to update the GDP model with a new proposed model that includes invisible female contributions spark an outburst from male-driven policies and government? <laughs> Richard, why not? <laughs> um, yeah, this is my point. Like, what we include in our key performance indicators for our countries really matter. You know, back when I was an academic in the 90s, you know, they started saying, you know, let's count your publications. And then everyone just wrote short, crappy papers. So they went, <laughs> oh, okay, now let's look at the quality of the journal. And now it's, oh, let's look at your best couple. And oh, let's, right? It's really hard to quantify what it is we want to achieve. So, yeah, absolutely. If we were to say, look, these things are important, we're going to value them, uh, then some people that do some other things might, might feel miffed about that. So... You know, this is my point that the data is important, don't get me wrong, but the data actually reflects uh, status, it reflects power, it reflects distribution, and saying we need more of this almost by definition means we need less of that. Right? These, these aren't just intellectual conversations. These are, if the indicators are matter, things change because of them. So anyone that likes things the way they are should feel quite threatened by change. There you go. Um, I believe we also have a question in the audience over here. Is that right? So I find it very interesting that the industry super funds, um, which, as you say, are one of the largest sources of capital in the, in the world, um, have this kind of orientation to the public good, presumably because they would capture so much of the benefit of, of any improvement in, in mental wealth that, that it would be in their interest to do so. And I mean, I guess this is kind of the flip side of monopoly, right? When you've got a really, really, really big player, it benefits um, if the economy as a whole benefits. And I'm just very interested in the fact that they chose to fund this research and, and what that kind of dynamic plays in it. Yeah, look, um, I think it's worth 
recognising that there's a benefit in a sense of scale. Where you've got, say, um, a company that's owned by, say, a diffuse bunch of shareholders, they don't see anyone, any benefit for um, taking responsibility for on-the-job training. They want to get their share in, make as much money and then get out. Because super, the, the Australian super funds have said, well, we've got to actually get a revenue stream over a very long period of time and we've now got this responsibility. They can, they can see that simply getting in and getting out quickly is not good. Um, they want to have an asset that's worth something over time and so the idea of social sustainability is just as important for them as it is for financial sustainability. So you are right, it is a question of scale. But um, I think it was Mark said that, you know, actually monopoly capital is actually a good thing. You know, that you actually get an economy that gets um, big reserves and can make big investments and can make big breakthroughs. So, yeah, th th there is, you're right, there is a different connection between scale and, and this issue. Um, there's an interesting bit of theory that you might want to look up called the universal shareholder theory. It's a fascinating thought experiment. This is a thought experiment. But Australia's super system is so big, the thought experiment's getting close. So imagine you had all the pension funds in Australia. Let's just make Australia. What if they grew and merged and grew and merged such that you had one big super fund? And what if everyone in Australia and let's say everyone, but we mean every worker, was a member of that fund, then there'd almost be no externalities. So an external cost is a fundamental problem in economics where I make a decision that's good for me, but it's imposing costs on people who aren't involved in the decision. But if I was the trustee of the one big super fund, an Australian super is, you know, pretty big, and I own shares in everything, then if this company's ripping off this company, it's not helping me. But if I, don't own, if I own or am significantly invested in all the companies and all the workers work for the companies, if I'm ripping off my workers in company A, I'm actually ripping off my members. Because if all the workers are members of a super... Right? So the universal share ownership stuff is really conceptually challenging for traditional economics because rather than saying, but if there's billions of customers, everything's small, everything's small, everything's atomistic, well, that world's gone. We're far closer to the universal share ownership model where if, yeah, if you're an industry super fund with $300 billion invested in every company in the ASX, then do you really want the boards of one company spending huge amounts of money in wars with another company? No. And if you're representing hundred, you know, uh, uh, if you're representing a couple of million workers, if you're ripping off some of those workers so the company can make a bigger profit, so the return to the workers can be a bit bigger, it all gets a bit weird, doesn't it? So check out universal share ownership. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, I think we'll finish on this final question that seems to be quite upvoted as well, which is, where do you see the role of people managers in impacting the mental health and wealth of an organisation? John, that's probably one for you. Yes. Um, that's a, it's a really good question, and that's why we have the three-part research program, right? So. At, and that's why we're working with the nurses. Um, you know, they've got nurse unit managers who've got to look after a shift and they, they've got to look after the, the health and well-being of their workforce and they've often got uh, imperfect information systems. So, yes, this is a, a tool that will make transparent what the problems are and potentially give you leverage at a local level to argue the case for a better outcome. But um, I suppose what we'd like to underline for our research program is that there's only limited space for you at a worksite level to make a huge difference. You can make a difference, but it's, it's circumscribed. And you, you might remember I showed you that diagram of the layers of management and the value ecosystem. To really shift the die, you've got to engage with all the levels of management and engage with the entire ecosystem, which is why we're looking at those systemic changes with, super, with um, workers' compensation as a potential leverage point. But then ultimately even that is constrained by the national settings, which is why we're interested in GDP. So, yes, you can make a difference. You know, a, a good HR manager is a lot better than a, than a not good HR manager. 
but there are still significant constraints. And so the, the burden of our analysis is we want to give you something that is relevant, but we're not pretending that you can solve this at the level of the local work site. You can take the raw edge off a situation, but you can't really stop the big generative mechanisms. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think we're actually running over time already, so I think that we will have to close up the Q&A section. I'm so sorry to everybody who sent in the fantastic questions via Slido that I just had to skim past, but would you mind please giving a round of applause to our wonderful panel, Richard, John and Joe? Thank you so much. And we can, we can answer questions. We're around. Oh, if people okay. Want, if well, people have a particular question, we're happy to answer them or offer you references. Speak for yourself, John. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Some of our panellists will be answering <laughs> questions after this. Uh, so please feel free to grab them in the foyer. And again, thank you so much for everybody for joining us here and online. We really appreciate it. And for links to any of the resources that we have touched on in today's talks, please visit the Sydney Ideas website, which is sydney.edu.au slash sydney dash ideas. So thank you very much for attending and we hope to see you at future sessions. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>